This project is all about making use of a part of my house that no longer has any function. This jut out into my dining room contains a large metal exhaust chimney, which was for an old furnace style. The furnace that came with our house was already a high efficiency furnace with two pipes going out the side of the house, so this chimney hasn't been used in quite some time. I chose to use a jigsaw to cut out the opening and quickly realized that the shop vac was necessary. I used standard jigsaw blades which lost all their teeth about every 3 feet or so worth of cutting. This is because my walls are made of what looks like 3 8 inch thin drywall strips and then half an inch of honestly what looks like cement, but I'm not that familiar with the way plaster was done in the 70s. The chimney was easy enough to muscle out a place on the bottom, but I had to get very aggressive with the top as there was a coupler and an elbow going through the metal plate entering the attic. This also led to some of my freshly blown in insulation raining down on me. I installed a piece of plywood on the bottom just in case one of my kids didn't end up listening to my stay out instructions and a large piece on top to seal off the attic space. Now on to constructing the cabinet that will sit inside of the wall cavity. This cabinet will be 23 and a half inches deep from the face of the drywall to the back edge. The back piece of melamine is 13 inches wide, which is the overall width of the studs inside the walls. This is 5 8 inch melamine particle board and the joinery method for making this cabinet is dead simple. I'm using butt joints and 1.5 inch brad nails to hold everything in place while I come back with 2 inch construction screws. While working with particle board, it's critical to drill pilot holes and drill shallow counter sinks to avoid splitting. To install the other side piece, I flip over the unit onto it with a few spacer blocks in the middle. This makes sure the melamine isn't bowed in the middle and remains flat along the edge. The last thing to do to this cabinet is install a fixed shelf near the top. I place a few 13 inch spacer blocks and tack the shelf in place with more brad nails. I then mark with pencil some lines to follow as I drive in more 2 inch screws. I can now cut two spacer blocks from scrap pieces of 3 quarter inch plywood. These get screwed in place along the bottom of the cavity and are used to support the weight of the cabinet as well as set the correct height off the ground. Next I could finesse the cabinet into the hole by first tipping it backwards then giving it a little tappy tap tap into the hole. Give it a little tappy, tap 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 a -roo. I measured how far the studs were from the face and drove in four two and a half inch screws to secure the cabinet. Next back in the shop I can rip some one by pine boards down to width to be used as the face frames of the cabinet. I then cut all five pieces to length and give every piece a good sanding and make sure to break the hard edges as well. Next I cut more one by material to two and a half inches in width to be used as the door frames. Everything is cut to length at the miter saw and then back at the table saw with my flat tooth blade installed. I can begin running the frame pieces over the blade set at half an inch up to create a groove for the quarter inch hardboard panel. I can then cut some shoulders onto both sides of the short rail pieces to create half inch tenons to be glued into the same slot as the panel during assembly. I can then rip some quarter inch hardboard, which is less than 0.25 inches by the way, to width and then over to length at the miter saw. Since the panel is hardboard and not real wood, I apply glue along all the grooves since the wood won't move. This adds a ton of strength to the door and works great. I make sure to have lots of glue on the tenons at the end and begin assembling the door. A clamp is added at each end as well as a couple in the middle to make sure the center measurements match the end as the styles seem to have a slight bow in them. I then sanded all sides with my random orbit sander and then over at the router table gave a quarter inch chamfer to the outside edges. The location of the router table in my shop made it so I couldn't complete this operation so I took the router out of the table and finished the chamfer over at my assembly table which makes way more of a mess. I then gave the door and face frame pieces a coat of primer and followed that up with two coats of white melamine paint. I start the face frame assembly by applying glue along the back and driving three 2 inch brad nails to the three horizontal pieces. I can then apply glue along the vertical pieces of melamine and drive in a whack of 2 inch me nails to forever make this its home. The same is done to the other side and it's back outside to the door. I start by marking the center of the door on the back side for the center hinge location. The two end hinges will be offset by the width of a hinge. The hinges are laid in place and a self-centering bit is used to drill pilot holes for the screws that came with the hinges. 
To mount the handle, I first mark the center minus half the distance between the screw holes. I then mark the center of the stiles and drill a large hole to allow the small bolt to pass through. The other hole location is marked by laying the handle down to ensure accuracy. The handle is then screwed on and the door is complete. To install the door, I make sure it's spaced evenly all around, drill a pilot hole with a self-centering bit, and drive in a 3 quarter inch screw which came with the hinges. I then do the same for the bottom hinge, and then can drive in the remaining 4 screws to fully attach the door. With the door attached, this broom closet is complete, and ready for storing our vacuum, because we don't actually own a broom. Next time, it won't be so easy.